Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in out chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey, everybody. Episode 232 of the Bitcoin podcast flagship show of the bitcoin podcast network and i am your first host marcello and i am host number two d host number three dr Corey petty and today we have a fourth host again miss taylor monahan say hello 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 you're you're always on the show now you're like your fan, your fan. we're slowly <laughs> making you like an official host but surely yeah. without you knowing it I'm more than happy, although at some point these 7 a.m.s are going to be, <laughs> I'm going to push back on you guys. <laughs> you get for living on the West Coast. Wait, does that mean it's a tie ball game? Because I've been trying to change this time for quite a while. Yeah, D's <laughs> brain doesn't work in the morning. For some reason, he's up at like 5 o'clock making banners. Yeah, but I can't record <laughs> a couple hours later. Hey, ma'am. I don't know. <laughs> it's my biological clock. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I will say uh, my crypto is getting very popular on social media now. Like you guys can't make a tweet without it getting like faved at least a hundred times. So congrats. Um, yeah, we're getting, we're, we're, the tides are shifting. And I think that we're finally seeing like the drama is, is a thing of the past and there's new exciting drama. Um, so they're just, people are kind of stoked to be using our product, which is what I've been waiting for, for a really, really, really long time. That's good. Usually that's wait, wait, wait. It's no longer my crypto. It's my crypto cash Satoshi's ABC vision. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> According to their last tweet. So that tweet was inspired by a conversation we had with with so on Fridays we have all hands calls and we had to explain to some of the the newer the the people that are newer to the blockchain. We had to explain to them what a hard fork is what uh causes a hard fork to like actually split into two different coins or two different networks um and and during that process we realized just how freaking absurd the entire situation is mm -hmm. would you like to elucidate how frequently absurd this entire situation is to the, our audience yeah. i think we're obligated I mean... yeah we have to talk about it we don't have a choice <laughs> It's so the way that we try to like first we dove into the technical stuff. So basically, when you think about hard forks, um, you're doing the network is is upgrading itself, um, and sometimes that results in sort of breaking changes where uh, the new set of rules that the network is following aren't compatible with the old set, and because you know, every, like a blockchain is this chain of blocks where you build a block on top of a block on top of a block. Uh, if, you know, you're playing with two different sets of rules, that chain is actually going to split because on one chain, you can have maybe five blocks included that all, all um, are sort of approved by these rules. And on the other one, you have maybe only four or you have a different set of five or whatever. Now, where it gets really fun is when you talk about, you take into account all the politics and uh, the social media shitstorm and, you know, people want things to go their way. And so they're trying to convince the entire world that their way is the right way and they should follow them. Um, and that has, that's what we're seeing with Bitcoin Cash right now. You're being really nice about it based on how we talked about it yesterday. <laughs> so just because it's in the morning doesn't mean you got, you know. <laughs> um, 
we came to the conclusion that it is a big dick sweeping contest between the bch or that the two different uh bitcoin cash forks right now and that's that it boils down to basically that there's there's no other real technical reason for that that chain to fork right now yeah exactly it is purely egotistical and self-serving and it it it's quite interesting how it sort of played out because it seems like the exchanges have decided to sort of just kill the the bch ticker and so it seems like bch as a ticker at least is dead and we're gonna have bch abc and bch sv uh so you get two new tickers which is it's different we haven't done that before right like you know with the eth etc split obviously like ethereum carried on uh the bitcoin bitcoin cash split bitcoin carried on so to have a hard fork where the sort of original name dies and now you have two different things um nobody really won the battle everyone sort of lost in my opinion so roger yeah. bear hasn't tweeted in two days so that's that's something i think that like <laughs> one for a group of people that treats satoshi like some sort of demigod I mean, Satoshi pretty much outlined the consequences of hard forking and was like, we don't do this unless it's non-contentious. So you... Did he? Dis- I feel like... He Satoshi- said that. And his, he said that in on his little, what is it, Bitcoin talk, the thing that he used to hang out on and talk with Gavin and Dreesen. He was like, a hard fork is a no-no. Take all the time to have all the you know concentrated discourse that you need, but you don't have a contentious hard fork because there's ripple effects of that we're still feeling in the greater crypto community till today. And so for like a whole group of people to be so, I don't know, rabid over that shit to then have a fork like this is just very ironic. And then I would also like to add, I don't know if this is the Craig Wright is a dipshit. I just wanted to throw that out there. So and I just hope I that, that this is of- slowly pushing him further and further into obscurity. Although I will say I have been really enjoying the uh dr craig s wrong twitter handle that recently <laughs> popped up uh he's, yeah. he does a really good job of make, like making a parody of of uh yeah the parody right, accounts right. are rampant how how did that take so long it's such an obvious like play on words I don't, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know what i don't know that's, you should you, you would think that that would have uh come out well, oh my gosh there is there's been some sort of like there's been glimmers of sanity in that the the muck that is bcash and that is the lightning network seems to have grown what is 126 percent almost last week and like one day yeah the capacity is like 1.4 million dollars which is around what 220 some odd bitcoin um which is a big deal but i mean it's kind of not at the same time because the lightning network is just budding but it's interesting, nonetheless. I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts about that, or you guys haven't been following the Lightning Network stuff? I very haven't much. been following it very much. I will say that there's the the Lightning Wallet does this really cool thing. I sent this to Corey actually. Mm-hmm. So depending on whether you're like on Lightning or on the, I guess the main net or whatever they call it, um, the whole interface, like the color choices, change. So that it's like super obvious which one you're on and and it Hmm. doesn't have to like, it's not just like a little label or like something that's easily missed. It's like the entire color palette or the entire theme changes. And I just think that's a really, from a design perspective, a really interesting thing. That is, it kind of like forces the user to think a certain way. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we have me yeah. and me and Taylor have been talking recently about like the 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 power of using color to inform users about um, the decisions they're making, because mm-hmm. it's it's really difficult to get people to understand like what they're doing and what settings they have and what consequences those settings have on uh, how they use this technology. And I was doing it from a security perspective and privacy perspective. Um, I think you're going to start seeing a lot of that because it's, it's it's really difficult to educate people in apps. You can't just say like set it forget it and then like use it because because you're in charge of everything you need to be much much more aware of um what your how your settings affect your privacy and security Mm -hmm. and And how those sort of evolve over time right 
Yeah. And you can't, you can't expect them to learn everything to do that. That has to be like a visual indicator of like change so that you're like, oh shit, what happened? I just did something. Or like, I'm doing something that's different than what I was doing. Yeah. I agree. This, that, that, I bet that's really cool. I haven't used the lightning wall yet. Um, but I would love to see that. I'll send you the post. We'll put the post in the show notes. Let me make a note of that. Yeah. I wonder oh. if it's all these Casa nodes. What's up, Chell? I had a question for Taylor because we are um, we're kind of knee deep in this Boost VC thing that's going on, and wanted to know how your experience was when you were affiliated with them. With Boost? Yeah. It was it. Um, was it worth it? So, yes, but yes, like a hundred percent, yes. But our situation was, I think, maybe a little bit different than than some people's situations, um, because essentially when um, sort of if you go back in time before my crypto was a thing and when we were still my Ether wallet, I was obviously dealing with like just uh, a, a huge ass shitstorm. Like 2017 in itself was was insane. Uh, co-founder drama just upset insanity. Um, me not really knowing like which direction to go, um, is now like insanity and confusion. Um, and so I actually like literally drove up to San Mateo one weekend and we sat down with Brayton and Adam from Boost VC. And I basically said like, I have no idea what I'm doing and I really need help. And they helped me. And then that's like eventually how we got into the program. And they've just been like consistently, giving me really good insights, um, answering like questions that I have, giving me resources, but most of all, just being like sort of this external force that I can rely on. Because one of the hardest things about having, like running a company yourself is that you don't, like you can't necessarily go to your team members <laughs> with with some problems. Like you have to, a lot of times, um, you know, you have to pretend you know what you're doing at least. So having <laughs> hold your bearing. Oh, I got this. This is good. I, I do this all the time. Hold, yeah. Yeah. Hold, holding that bearing. So when you, you know, when I was when I was trying to like navigate everything and figure out the best path forward, the best path forward for like us as a company and the team, um, but also like the Ethereum community, having those uh, the people that that have experienced it or watched it with like all their portfolio companies and have resources and connections and all of that was was probably like I probably couldn't have done it without Brayden and Adam's help honestly that's good to have in your corner mm -hmm. some super boosted VCs yeah Let's well and, and the <laughs> the um that's sort of how I ended up looking at like investors, right? Is that I, I, um, I wasn't looking at, at taking investment, like just for the capital. I was looking at, okay, if we're going to align incentives, if we're going to give them a piece of our company, um, they're now incentivized to help us and, and help us navigate this world and make good choices. And if we have to make hard choices, help me weigh the decisions and stuff. Um, in that case, like I want the smartest people in my corner. I want the people that have huge portfolios of companies where they're dealing with similar things and they've watched how how different outcomes have been. Um, I want people rooting for us. Like those are the types of things I was looking for investors, not necessarily like, you know, playing the how much money will you give me game. And I think that that's one thing that like the all the companies that did token sales kind of are missing out on because yeah, you have a fuckload of capital, but you don't have, um, you don't really have anyone in your corner. You have a bunch of token holders, either, you know, hyping <laughs> your shit or, or, you know, or Win shitting moon. on it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm a bit worried. Like, I hope these companies that did token sales, like have really, really strong advisors that can make up for some of the, what they're, they're missing out on a little bit. Well, that's the thing is like, we're not uh, a company per se. We're, you know, the question is, is a podcast investable? You know, if we're candidates for Tribe 12, what what could a bunch of VCs and a bunch of advisors and a bunch of smart people take the podcast mold and what could they turn it into when mass adoption hits? Or could we be positioned to be 
the CNBC or the CNN of, of crypto podcasts, what is the vision for the future? And I don't think anybody knows. So we're, we're just kind of going down that path and seeing what happens. Yeah. I mean, I think content is such a huge thing and, and it's in the traditional world, it's proven to be a, um, not only a, like a, a very powerful force, but also like a huge money maker. So yeah, but it, it, that's the, that's the issue, right? It's, is money maker, Mike. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that I worry about the most is, is what? this podcast that we're turning into a money maker and just, the, and then we lack quality content that actually helps people. You can right. do both. And that's, it just, and that's like, you know, when I'm talking about navigating this crazy world and navigating like the crypto world, but also like the, the business world, those are the, the sort of the hard decisions or the, the things that you have you have to get outside input on and people who've done it before because uh, otherwise it's just like me sitting in my room going like, I think that we shouldn't make money because it possibly threatens our content. And, you know, it, it's um, getting alternate views and then kind of using all those different views to to find your perfect path is that's sort of what business is all about, in my opinion. I agree. Well, let's put out some quality then. I got something I wanted to talk about. And for a long time, I was wondering, is there any correlation between the hash rate, change in the hash rate, and the change in the price? I was curious because everybody gets so amped up, right? Like we damn near pray to aliens when the happening is coming and we all fly out to Vegas or we all like have a rager and then nothing usually happens, at least for another eight months or so. So... Uh, I crunched some data. So before I crunched, tell the data that I crunched, Corey, can you tell the newbies what hash rate is? Yeah, sure. So in, uh, in 17 words or less. 17 words or less. <laughs> Go. Hash rate is the combined computational effort of everyone mining. Okay. That's seven words. Good job. All right. So... The hash rate changes for you guys that don't know. The hash rate changes every was it 2014 blocks? Something wait, like wait, that. wait. We we should we should in, explain in 17 words or less why this is relevant. Yeah, sure. Uh, hash rate is the de facto security, the measure of security of the blockchain. In order to co-opt a blockchain, you need to take. 51%, we'll just, we'll just go with that for now, 51% of the hash rate to start falsifying blocks. Okay. That's the, that's the layman's definition of why hash rate is important. It's basically how hard it is to co-opt the blockchain there for proof go. of work. So, so what I did is I went back to January 26, 2012, and I took two-day timestamps of what the hash rate was in terahash per second. And I did that all the way up until last week, right? So that's a lot of data. Let me see, I can actually have it open. That's, give me the count, 1,239 timestamps, right? And I correlated that with the closing price in USD on those two day timestamps. Uh, I didn't correlate it. I just kind of like put another column, put the price there. And then I did the change in the hash rate in those two days and the change in the price in those two days. So big surprise, no correlation. Zero. You know, they're, they're like, there are actual like correlation algorithms. You can run correlation yeah, plots. I, I ran the correlation plots and the algorithms and there's a negative 0.042 correlation between terahash per second and the change in price. And there is a 0.016 correlation between the change in hash rate and the change in the price. So what you should do now, I, I, I that's interesting. We're going to talk about it, but what mm -hmm. you should do is publish this um, and you know, how you did it and what your findings were so that people can argue with it. If it can be argued with against mm -hmm. that's how science so, works. So <laughs> I ain't no scientist. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you're if you're doing this, you are a scientist. <laughs> I thought that was very scientific. Um, I, this is fascinating because I always assumed that, say, the price goes up, right? Like the price of Bitcoin goes from 1000 to 2000 
now you have more miners that are incentivized to secure the network, right? Like they're they're incentivized to 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 mine, and mm-hmm. it's more profitable. So, you know, the same thing that I. I thought I assumed when the price goes down, you know, some of the the littler miners may turn off some of their their machines because it's not profitable anymore. When the price goes back up and it's profitable again, they would turn them back on or reallocate their resources and therefore the hash rate would would follow the price. But if that's not the case then holy crap, that's super interesting. There's some points of uh, contingent, not contingency. Well, that could be contingency. Like I took two day timestamps, right? What if I took 60 day timestamps or, or 90 day timestamps? Would that, would that change anything? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is a lot more granular than that, but um, as increasing a, resolution know, typically doesn't have that type of type of thing. I didn't think so either, but I was like wondering. So um, someone is free to do that if you want. Um, the one thing, I don't know if you guys can see it now. I think I shared my screen. You did. Yeah. This histogram of the change in price, I thought was interesting because it says like 86% of the price changes are between what? 8% and negative 8% somewhere in this little range right here. So that's pretty neat. I don't I'm going to have to look at this. Like I would like to look at this in more detail just so I can nitpick it. Well, go for it. I mean, I'll give you the link. Well, you have the link because it's in the drive. So. Um, I'm like, I, I want just... you to publish it. I want I want you to publish it so I can openly yeah. critique it. You want me to like work? This gets me excited. I like this stuff, right? This is this is like uh, I wanted. I no, wanted to. Do it. This is what the first uh, analysis that I ever saw of Corey's. That's how we're friends right now. Is through math. Isn't that yeah. cute? That's yeah. the cutest. <laughs> so, um, I thought that was neat. Uh, if you guys want to check it out, I guess I'm now socially obligated to finish the Medium post and put it on our Medium. So yes. it doesn't even have to have a lot of like explainers. Just just no. if you just say what you did in the results and then have some like you know qualitative conclusions from your results, that's enough for someone to to talk about. Put the graphs up there. Yeah. Yeah. And explain so, what the graphs are and what they say. I'm wondering if we took the same the same you did this analysis on bitcoin right only bitcoin. yeah this is this is bitcoin but i probably could do it for ether yeah ether or even like a, a smaller little shit coin that that's still proof of work because i'm wondering if bitcoin is just like so established that the price changes don't um they don't affect the hash rate because mm. it's just like it's just so established that that you know the big mining pools aren't like you know, it's changing based on the price. But if you were on like um, some other chain, if the price would uh, be affected mainly because perhaps like Bitcoin miners, um, if they see another chain being insanely profitable for whatever reason, they would switch their their Bitcoin to whatever. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I have a I have like a I guess hypothesis of that um the the correlation should change over time depending on what's happening in real life like for instance you should see a larger correlation between hash rate and price um when the b when btc forked into btc and bch because in actual the, the miners were jumping back and forth um drastically between hash rate and price analysis so there should be some type of increase mm-hmm. there based on the what was actually happening with the miners and if you mm-hmm. don't if you don't see that then i'd be that'd be very interesting yeah. One thing you could probably we could probably never get that on to know is the OT- OTC trading, which I don't know. I don't like whatsoever, but it's just a part of. Oh, because that doesn't get factored into price analysis because it doesn't at you know, all, man. We have no yeah. idea how much Bitcoin's being swapped back and forth between super duper rich people. They keep that shit. <laughs> off, they keep it off the blockchain, so you never know. So, I mean, it's probably wise because if they put it on the blockchain, then no, they, the they, price would be... What do you mean they keep it off the blockchain? No, they it's don't. A, they it's over the counter, right? The, they keep so it they keep off, it off, the, off the, the, exchanges, the exchanges, right? Yeah. They keep it off the exchanges. So you only get to see the You movement. can't tell the difference between legitimate money movement between two people and actually selling money for fiat. Sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. They keep it off the exchanges, which I don't know. Is it good or bad? I, I don't really know, but... 
Well, we saw with, um, do you remember when the the Mount Gox guy decided to like sell some of the Mount Gox stuff to liquidate yeah. it on like the open market? Oh, it, no. was, it was like, I mean, this People is why you don't do it. that. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, and Jesse from Kraken was like, um, excuse me, like, yeah. <laughs> listen to me. I'm in this space. Don't do that. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. You might want to not do that. Well, I thought, well, I'm glad that we did, dabbled in like some of the fundamentals of Bitcoin and proof of work chains because it kind of aligns with our guest and what he focuses on with his content. No, I'd say so. That's the name. Charlie, of you want to bring him in? Yeah, it's uh, Matthew Aaron, who is host of the Crypto 101 podcast, our fellow podcasting peer. And yep. uh, we actually did some cross pollination. We'll actually be on his show next week. So be on the lookout for that. But for now, he's on our show, one on one with D. All righty. Here it is. And hello, hello. Welcome to another one of our, our, our amazing interviews that you guys love so much. And we love to bring to you amazing people in the crypto sphere, the crypto ecosystem as they call it or the the i love this one the space with quotations the crypto space but without further ado uh we bring you uh, matthew aaron the the editor-in-chief of, of crypto 101 media uh the lead i think the lead host of crypto 101 podcast and the author of crypto 101 johnny's guide to cryptocurrencies welcome to the show What's up, man? How you doing? Thank you for having me on. Good deal. Good deal. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So we've we've had the very fortunate um, positioning of being able to watch your show begin and then grow into what it is now, which is just this amazing show um, that I, I loved your focus because I, too, I had a show called On Ramping with D that kind of fizzled because I couldn't find enough people to, you know, to fill the... Uh, needing to be on ramped um i guess persona uh everybody either heard about crypto and didn't want to hear about it anymore or were too scared to hop on a mic and then it seems like you focused on the general audience and focused on uh, educating people about crypto and so you know congratulations on the success and it was, i wanted to have you on the show and we could just shoot the shit right <laughs> so thank you Thank you very much. I, I think we we're discussing this off air a little bit. Um, but when I first got into cryptocurrency, it was, you know, uh, late 2016, early 2017, before I made the show in July of 2017. Uh, you guys were actually the podcast I was listening to. Uh, so it was you guys and a couple others. We discussed this off, off the air. And um, so, yeah, I've been following, following your show for a while. And I'm really happy to be able to come on right now and and wrap out with you guys. Cool. But I, think it's, I think it's just you you today, though. Yeah, it's just me. We had some technical difficulties, and Corey is uh, still dealing with jet lag from Prague on old DevCon. Um, mm. So it's just me. I was hoping to be all three of us, but uh, you know, maybe you can get the three of us when we come on Crypto One Hundred and One, and then right on, right. then it'll really be wrapping. So, uh, do you remember what episode it was? Which is that? Well, that you were listening to our show. It had to have been a while ago. That's twenty sixteen. Oh no, yeah, no, no. Like, I, like I said, I would consist. Like, it was the show that I would listen to. Uh, so, I mean, there was the uh, whatever shows you were putting out in two thousand and seventeen. There um, okay. was was I was listening to, and then I just actually, to be perfectly honest, I don't listen to much uh, many crypto podcasts uh, these days. You're making uh, them. I, I, I'm, I'm making them. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> As you know, it takes a lot of time. Uh, so, so yeah, making making them these days, and uh, but I just popped on for your last one. Um, that you did and you guys are hilarious still but so i appreciate you guys still pumping out the content and and, yeah. and doing it for for the quote unquote space yeah for, for the space so ominous sounding right yeah. um well thank you for tuning in all those times uh that's a uh, finally i finally put like a line in the sand and i was thinking like um i'm so tired of keeping up with things like i, mm -hmm. I want to make something that people have to keep up with and so that so it's kind of like it's a delicate dance right because in this uh in, in crypto you have to keep up with certain things like there's especially if you're doing media like you know you just you got to follow certain uh trends certain uh 
um, new technologies that people are getting excited about. But for the most part, I was like, every day someone's like, have you heard about this token? Have you heard about this project? And it's like, no, I haven't. I can't keep yep. up with, with all of these things. So, And then you get the, you get the tweets from people or the DMs and say, hey, check out this wallet or check out this thing we did and check out yeah. this uh, this portfolio app. And it's just like, man, I want to try them all, but I just don't have the time. Yeah. What Have you gotten any... Um, I guess solic solicitation for some questionable tokens where you're like, come on, man, what is that? You know, uh, to be perfectly honest, no. Um, we we get we get emails a lot, and I don't know what what you would mark as questionable tokens. Um, but you know, a lot of people always email out and say, hey, we want to have this ICO on the sh on ICO 101, or can you can we come on your show or what have you? And you know, I think that at the beginning, a lot of them are are kind of. Um, you have to look into them uh, very diligently, do your own research on all of them, um, because mm -hmm. at, at, a, at the ground stage, it's really, everybody has basically the same building blocks. You know, they use the, almost the same template from Wix.com or whatever they do to build their <laughs> site up. And then, um, you know, they have the same pictures of their of their team, their staff, and then you try to have to, you know, search a little bit to see what was going on in their history. Um, but yeah, man, I, I think I think the most questionable things that we had is not from tokens, but may, maybe people who build apps and things like that. And they say, hey, sign up to the app and, or sorry, download the app and, you know, try to use it. And then the app is just uh, automatically, you know, asking for uh, name and email and things like that. And it's just a data collection. You're just like, no, bro, can't sign up. You mm -hmm. know, I think, that, I think that's the number one thing is just people, you know, making apps and just trying to get you to sign up. And, and you know, you don't know where your email is going to go or what they're going to try to do with your data. Yep, absolutely. There's a lot. There's, there's, a, there's a couple apps that we interviewed that have since disappeared. And so it's like, man. I hope they got a good, good amount for what they sold my damn email for, because they got me. Uh, <laughs> because it because it starts showing up in your email too, and you're just like, "Yep, you got me." <laughs> yep. I don't know how. I'm, yep. I don't know how I'm getting this, but all right. So, what was your um? You know, podcasting usually starts as a side gig for most people. I assume it started that way for you. Um, what What were you doing before you got into the crypto one on one? Like what? What was your profession? What was, what was a little bit about your background? Well, man, I was in uh, uh, food and beverage for probably ever since I was 16 years old. Man, I was uh, one of those kids that just met much rather go to work than go to school. Mm -hmm. And and I went straight into washing dishes, went straight to chefing, went straight to managing, went straight to the front of the house. And I found myself in uh, in China in um, um, as a manager of the best nightclub in Asia. Hmm. And, and it was a it was a nightclub, restaurant, lounge, um, huge, huge operation and venue. Um, you know, it, and it was a very interesting experience. And then, you know, went into a director of hotels and, um, you know, back into nightclubs and things like that uh, around in Shanghai and in, in Hong Kong. But to be perfectly honest, I am I'm getting old. You can't do that that kind of job for for a long time. I'm, hmm. I love hospitality. I've always been in customer service and I've always been, you know, working with people. Um, you know, but as I got older, of course, I went to university, I did my MBA and things like that. Um, but I wanted to make a, a change, you know, and I, I found uh, if people who listen to Crypto 101 heard my motivation uh, stories is that um, I wanted to get into something that actually could help with, you know, uh, help with my motivation story. And also, uh, you know, just was going to be something new to change the world. And like, that's what we found in, in blockchain and in, in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and, and all these new emerging companies that are coming out here thinking differently in, in, in the world. You know, I'm a mm -hmm. global citizen, you know, lived, like I just said, I lived in Asia, I live in Taiwan right now, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, things like that. Um, born in Cleveland, you know, so moving around for me and, uh, you know, traveling and things like that is just a part of life, you know? So mm -hmm. when, when every time I have a drawer full of, of bits and pieces of currencies that I can't spend anymore or, 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 or you know, um, different ways of not being able to use my credit cards when I'm at uh, hotels in either Thailand or Cambodia or wherever I'm going to be traveling to, it's, 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 you see that there's a utility there. There's a practical mm -hmm. use for Bitcoin and a practical use to start, you know, breaking down these imaginary borders and allowing these global citizens, us, me and you, that because what we're doing right now is being a global citizen. We are we are communicating across the world. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know where you are, but I'm like I said, I'm in South Tainan or I'm in South Taiwan. 
Mm-hmm. And man, we're hopping on and we're going to spread whatever we sp- speak to now to, you know, thousands of people globally. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, man, blockchain and Bitcoin is the place to be. But I th- I do think that slowly but surely, I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime. Um, I'm a little bit old. I'm 33. But I do think that more and more global citizens, that's just going to be a way of of life for a lot of people for if if not a large percentage of their life but just a little bit i think that one of the countries that promotes that kind of lifestyle is australia i do believe like after they graduate from high school they're basically told to travel the world for a year before they come back to australia and go to school or come back and go to work or something like that and i see more countries kind of adopting that and i think it's a it's actually a program that that's subsidized by australia like they hey pick a pick a country you're going, you're going to live there for a year or you're going to travel for a year. And I think if, you know, more countries kind of adopt that, then more people will be comfortable being a global citizen. And uh, it's it's definitely cool that you see the utility of crypto, like from the jump. Like, yeah, I got a whole shelf or a whole drawer for coins and cash I can't use anywhere. And, right. you know, if, if that were if that were a uh, digital currency, then I could. So. My my whole my whole my whole crew is like global. Uh, we're going to call start calling them global citizens now. Let's just coin the name for the rest of the conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, my whole crew is a global citizen. You know, like for example, I have my one friend, um, close friend of mine. We worked in Shanghai together for seven eight years, and he is from Kosovo. He's actually a British citizen, and his wife is Russian. You know, so they have a, a, a they have a beautiful daughter together. And, you know, now they're flying from different countries and holding different passports and they're living in China together in Shanghai. So it's like all of this is is, is super like globalized and mixed. And I don't think most people know it any other way. You know, there's a lot of people that are just live in different places. They live with and, you know, have uh, once you have a family and, and kids that are from different places, you f- you find these huge barriers and obstacles throughout your whole life. If it's not like whose passport is your daughter going to hold, you know, which, which, which country is the best country. We have to rank our countries, which one's best, which one's going to offer better freedoms and protection in the future. And um, then, you know, if you're sending money from say the, from your home country to uh, your, from, I'm sorry, where you're living to your home country, you know, how are you going to do that? They actually told me a story is, is his wife uh, who is Russian wanted to send money back to her his her mom and they sent a western union western union ripped them off they couldn't find the money it was like forty thousand RMB, which is like a thousand i'm sorry how much is that forty thousand RMB is like seven thousand mm. dollars just gone you know and and nobody was taking responsibility for it the 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 receiving western union uh said that oh well, somebody came in here with your i don't know whatever secret word or whatever phrase and took mm-hmm. your money and he's like, the only person that had it was my mom. How, how is that even possible? So it must be a, a breach in security within your Western Union. But anyway, so these different issues come come up with uh, in our lives as global citizens constantly. Mm-hmm. And so it's only logical that Bitcoin blockchain is, is a solution. Yep, absolutely. When did you fall into Bitcoin and blockchain? Or did you fall? Here we go. Did you fall into crypto via the blockchain route or the Bitcoin route? I feel like there's kind of two large camps there. Like uh, that's that's what's just what, what I found recently in like the last six months or so. What's the what's the blockchain route and the Bitcoin route? The okay, so I will say that the the Bitcoin route I I feel like is is people that um they found crypto uh, due to the currency aspect of this, like wanting to spend it wherever, uh, wanting to hold it without you know any fear of it being frozen or taken as long as they hold on to the private key it's theirs and then i found the the blockchain camp is more of the hey currency is not even important this technology of blockchain can do so many fantastic things that we don't even really know yet but we're pretty sure that it can be fantastic those are i think the two camps are well first time i heard about bitcoin was in 2013 um and it was from the Stuff You Should Know podcast, uh, well, How Bitcoin Works or something like that. That's what the title was. And it was basically the utility because after in 2013, I've already been living in Asia for, um, I want to say, nine years. And it's just a constant, constant struggle, you know, to, you know, exchange money. I remember that I was paying off student loans, you know, after graduating from uh, my bachelor's degree. 
and just to get my, my money back that I was making in China to the United States to, you know, give it to to pay for these bills because, you know, China's accounts won't link up with your, you know, your Fannie Mae, whatever account or whatever the hell you have to pay, pay for there. It was just a, it was just a complete uh, disaster. So when I heard the Stuff You Should Know podcast, how Bitcoin works and they explained, you know, about mining and incentives and, you know, decentralization and, you know, transferring uh, value without borders. It was just like, bro, this is this is it. And so I, I guess Bitcoin and the currency aspect was the first, but blockchain technology is the is the reason why I am still here. Mm-hmm. It's what it's when I hear people say identity on the blockchain, and then oh man, it's fucking it's elect it's election day. I'm sorry, I don't know if you can cuss on your on your yeah, show. Yeah, you could let it rip, man. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, it's election day. Then you see all this all the, all this crap that's going on in like in like Florida and these other places that are trying to vote, and I'm an absentee absentee voter, man. How do how do you even absentee vote? I mean, you can you go to your consulate, but it's like I, I would have to go for example, like for voting for president is like months ahead of time before even the debates are done. You know, you have to send these send these in, and it's like, why can't we just do it instantly, securely? Blockchain, boom. You know, so you see all these applications and use cases all around the all around the globe for people like me. You know, it's it's so blockchain technology is the reason why I'm still going to be making this show and still advocating for it because there's solutions. There yep. is solutions right now, and in, in, and especially if you look at this election, when you see voter suppression. And people say, though, there is no such thing. Yes, there's voter suppression. There's, uh, there's, uh, you know, felons that can't can't vote for some reason in in Florida. And so, uh, Amendment Four is coming out to try to re- uh, correct that. It's like there's so much wrong that blockchain actually has solutions for. Mm-hmm. That's very true. It's um, it's hard to get away from the the token aspect of it, um, the currency aspect of it, though. Um, that's very true. There's some people that think that. We should totally just okay. This is a it's kind of an ongoing argument. I was cello were here to go between us. He thinks that the currency aspect should totally split away from blockchain, and those should be two separate things. And I, that's not possible in my head. But I don't I don't know what what do you think you'd vote for to separate the currency and separate blockchain? Like no token without or sorry blockchain without the token. Is that possible? to you i mean the to- token meaning value and price or token meaning a way of transacting that's a good question i would say because transacting could mean like you know transacting information or or voting um you know your voting preferences or data or what have you uh, but that doesn't ha- necessarily have to have a monetary value mm-hmm. let's say the monetary value aspect. I would agree with that. Then, yes, I think that that should be separated because I think that um, I just today, some uh, I think it was Joe Com of Bad Crypto Podcast tweeted about a debate that um, uh, Ronnie Moez and Vinny Lingham were having about Bitcoin price in 2019. And uh, I think Moez says it'll be 28,000 by 2019. And Vinny says there's no possible way. I didn't listen. I didn't read the transcript <laughs> to the to, to it, but I just saw the tweet. And I and my initial thought when I was taking a shower this morning, where everybody does their best thinking, um, is <laughs> who the hell who the hell cares? You know, I mean, yeah, if you're an investor, you you care. You're holding, you know, ten or a hundred or ten thousand Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, you want the price to go up, but as a utility, Bitcoin's utility, practical applications do not change no matter what price it is. So now we're just clouding the fact of what Bitcoin is really good for, which is crossing borders without regulatory and legislation. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, balances in place to send money where people need it at the time they need it and at the speed of life. Um, and we're talking about some stupid arbitrary numbers that people are p- pulling out of their ass in 2019. It's a waste mm-hmm. and, it, and it's clouding the actual uh, judgment. I'm sorry, the actual um, use cases of, of Bitcoin. So people just hear price, they don't see the applications. So yes, I think in that aspect, it should be separated. It's, it's delicate though, because that price is a huge part of the gamification of all this. Like if that mm-hmm. thing didn't have a price, nobody's dropping millions of dollars to open up a mining farm or, you know, nobody's going to spend hundreds of thousands to buy a bunch of video cards to start, you know, trying to get ether. Um, that, that price has a very important, a per, very important, it's a very important mechanism to how all of this works. And I feel like if, it's totally disregarded and totally stripped away, then 
that gamification is going to lead to to very centralized hands. That's just that's my opinion. I don't know. I I I think the price it is annoying, like you said. It's very fuzzy. It's very annoying to have to keep that into the you know the uh, the forefront of your mind all the time. What is the price? What's it going to be? Blah, blah, blah. One, those guys are just trying to get Twitter followers. So I'm not worried about them. Like <laughs> anybody can make price predictions. No, well, like, you, <laughs> you know, throw whatever you want in a numerator and divide it by 21 million. And there you go. Start. That's all. Let's just go to town. You can make price predictions all day if you want. True. Um, but I think that the monetary value of, the token is is what you know kind of drives that that system to work the it's feeding on greed so uh, you know it's take i call it a greed translator it just takes everyone's greed and is translating that into some value that we all agree or disagree on so i don't no, know I'm, I'm feeling you with that i'm feeling you with that um but i think that those and again i think that cello probably is, is correct with this if we're talking the same language is uh is we, when we're talking about the utility of blockchain technology and what it can do is price. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or Litecoin or, or Bitcoin cash, even, you know, if they are going from say Cleveland, Ohio to Tokyo in a 10 minute block and you're, and you're receiving your funds, uh, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what it's called. It doesn't matter what the price is. Um, and, you know, even if it was a stable coin, it would still work the same way. If you have funds in, in, in a coin or in a digital asset or even in U.S. dollars and you can put it into a digital asset to make sure that you transact when you need to transact, then the utility is there. Now, when you set about the decentralization of uh, the mining aspects of, you know, the rewards, the black rewards, the, the Bitcoin, whatever, to keep the, the system decentralized, that is a very good point. That is a very good point. But. I guess I'll come back to you and say how, how decentralized is ASIC mining um, and and who um, and does the does that does ASIC mining and the price are those correlated correl correlated to what you think the utility of Bitcoin is? It's great you asked that question because I've been trying to find out since Monday if they are <laughs> since yesterday if they are correlated. I'm trying to map the hash rate to the price changes and see if there is any correlation there. Um, as as so far. No, but I haven't expanded my time time reference very much. I haven't played with it that much. Um, I would say that ASICs being centralized is, hmm. I, I think the system will self self heal. Like as soon as it gets out of hand, there's going to be new competitors that could step up to the plate that can manufacture ASICs that would compete with those other people that are currently uh, winning the ASICs ASIC race. I know Big Bitcoin Cash has a one chain now. Then they split. Bitcoin Cash is about to split, right? They're about to fork. Yeah, they're about to fork. And then I, one, I don't know much about it though. I just got a text today about it. Yeah, and then like one fork is gonna have ASIC boost, and one fork is not gonna have ASIC boost. And like <laughs> ASIC boost is this whole thing. And then I remember I kind of I got I caught a little flack for defending ASIC boost because I was like, that's the point of mining. You want to have the best pickaxe, and if you make the best pickaxe, congratulations you've won you get more bitcoin like you're not going to get them all but you're going to get more that's the whole point of it right and then people are like oh no it's not fair because they have the best pickaxes and i was like what that's what do you mean that's the, that's what it's supposed to be um but i think there's there's always that it's kind of the game is there's always there's, as soon as it gets to a point where people start recognizing like oh those people are getting all of the bitcoin like they're, they're either going to naturally break apart so they don't have a percentage of the network that is detrimental, that decreases the value of what you're even mining to begin with. So they'll break apart or new competitors will step up to the plate to reduce their hash rate. Um, I I do think it's kind of like organic or it'll organically fix itself. Um, I, I, I kind of like... <sighs> I don't. I don't know if I don't know if this is a complete thought or a complete feeling or or, or anything yet because I'm just gonna just about it now. Is I feel that um, 
for decentralization, you need to keep the power into the individuals, the average consumers, the average person's hands. Mm -hmm. And that average person in the United States is making, what, $59,000 a year. And does that average person that makes $59,000 a year, this average salary, or let's go below and below, above, you know, with a couple um, degrees of freedom, let's just say 125000 and, and 35000 right, um, at the low end. Can these people pick up the, those tools, those pickaxes to participate in a system that is supposed to be for the decentralization of currencies to allow people the freedom and the liberty of what we talk about? And if ASIC mining is something that either requires too much electricity or is priced out of the average consumer's uh, pocketbook, then it is not about who has the pick, best pickaxe is just going to the same system that we participate in now where the person with the most resources is able to do the mining. And and this is no matter if you're mining gold or diamonds or coal or oil or 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 what have you. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to change. And I do appreciate people and coins and, and communities that are keeping the CPU and the GPU mining, um, even though the hash rate is going crazy. Uh, those tools, those pickaxes are still accessible by the average consumer if they want to go pick them up with their, that median uh, salary range. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know about ASICs yet. And the only reason why I don't know about ASICs is because they are price research restrictive, you know, an, an ant miner, bro, it's a couple thousand bucks, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you could find one yeah. and a couple thousand bucks for the average consumer or the average person with, you know, a couple of kids, that's, that's something, that's something that you, you and your, you and your significant other talk about for a while to, to purchase, yeah. you know, that isn't and just, then, you go willy nilly and go say, I'm, I got to hey, honey, I brought home an ant miner. Yeah, it's gonna be cool for the winter. Like it'll heat up the room, and right? You put it in the baby's room. Money? <laughs> Keep them warm. Yeah, and there's so many ifs. Like you said, if you could find one. Here's the thing: is if you end up getting one that's not broken, like there's a lot of ifs when it comes to buying these ASIC miners. If you get one that hasn't been used already and ran to shit, and you know it works properly, if you get one that is legitimate and not fake by sending something from some third party that built some something out of shit, if you get <laughs> yeah, it's it's def there's definitely a lot of ifs there. I remember I was I was like this close to buying an ASIC miner. Um, this was been back in 2014. And mm. on the website, it said like, um, and this is when BTC price was in like the um, hundreds. And so it costs, I don't know, like 25 BTC or something like that. 25 and, BTC? Yeah, 25 BTC. But it was a long time ago. It was when BTC was nowhere near what it is now. And then it was like, you it basically said here's a disclaimer for if you if you get a broken if you get a broken asic miner or don't get it at all we still get your money and i was like what I the agree. hell <laughs> yeah i was like that's that's kind of shady that's um, a little bit shady but <laughs> now but, i was thinking about getting into uh, asic mining too with a uh, litecoin and get an l3 back um i think uh, in july of uh, of 2017 but then I, I just I just opted against it. And I, I was just like, why am I trying to do this? You know, I don't know. It just seemed it seemed really restrictive. I think the price out here was around uh, 1700 US for for an L3. Does that sound right? 1700 for I don't know. I I didn't get into ASIC mining, but they are price. I know it's over 1500 if you want to even begin to try and make some money. So yeah, <laughs> you try to make some money up to yeah. seventeen hundred bucks, man. Which you know, hey, it's a business investment. I understand that, but it is it is restrictive for the average person if we want to maintain a network of uh, you know, of decentralization and provide that liberty to people that we are wanting and needing from mm -hmm. uh, central centralized banks and uh, financial institutions. Here's here's the thing that we talk about often on our show, um, and that is we want decentralization, but are we ever going to truly have it? And then like what? Are we really decentralizing things? Because if you look, even with proof of stake, right? Ethereum is trying to move to proof of stake, and um, but who's going to have all the stake? It's going to be the people that have been mining a shit ton of ether, or the people that were fortunate enough to buy a shit ton of ether, or mm. the people that have traded their way into having a shit ton of ether that mm. now will be staking, that have the, I guess, liquidity to both stake and use ether, right? Because if it costs thirty, it costs thirty-two ether to to open up a a shard i think is what they're calling it and 32 ether is what is that it's like six thousand bucks somewhere yeah about 6400 bucks today yeah and so still yet again we're talking about okay so how much are we decentralizing are we decentralizing just to say it or are we just simply 
trading who we trust. Mm. We we are redefining who we trust and why we trust them. Mm-hmm. That's that's what I think. If anything, crypto has ultimately done is said, "Wait a second, we have some trust mechanisms that seem to be collapsing around us in the fiat system, and that is showing through cases like 2008, through what I think right now we're in some sticky situations <laughs> when you've got 1.5 trillion dollars in student loan debt that's defaulted." And mm. then auto loan debt is the de- auto loan debt is defaulting, which is kind of yeah. crazy. And so Man. you're like, OK, so whoever we're trusting that's manufacturing the rule sets that currently exist is not working. And we're just flying into debt and blowing out budgets. Maybe we need to redefine our trust because at the end of the day, I mean, all this stuff kind of gets centralized to a point, does it not? And that's a, that's a really good point, a really good question. So I, I was thinking about like um, identity on the blockchain and just say putting criminal records on the blockchain, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I think that a big a big fallback, especially if you're moving from state to state or what have you, is let's just say there's violent criminals that have done, you know, horrible crimes, even if they're out of jail or pay their debt to society. You still have to, you know, first of all, if they say if they're from Ohio and they move to New York or Florida or California to get those records are almost you know, just like pulling teeth, right? Mm-hmm. But let's just say you had a, a the, the, every individual had their private key, if it was bio, biometrics or nano ledgers or private keys or, or, or paper wallets or whatever it was, you know, to, to, so they controlled their own data, their own criminal records or what have you. Who controls that that database? Who's maintaining that database of that, pub, that public ledger of, for the blockchain? Now, now, let's think about if we had put a minor for using proof of work we had it in every courtroom so they every courtroom every court of law or every at least maybe governing big governing house in um or courthouse in the united states was maintaining this ledger this le- of, of legal activities right um how would that be, be done so if it's asic mining so all these guys have to get get fucking get ant miners from china come on <laughs> man or, or should they be able to go buy a, buy a, a computer or a desktop or a server from Apple or Dell or wherever and put it into their courthouse to maintain this so they can run full nodes and actually, you know, uh, contribute to the network, you know, and, and, and have that hashing power to make it even. So now let's talk about proof of stake. So how do we get, give people the stake? Does we create a blockchain where every state gets their own uh, equal amount of, of uh, you know, stake to maintain, mm-hmm. to, to maintain it? So California and Rhode Island is going to have the same amount. Is, is that is that fair? I don't I don't know. I don't know. But all I'm saying is, is that if we don't find a solution to these to this way of maintaining the ledger to make it fair and accessible to everybody, you're right. I think centralization is going to come out of it. And then we don't have that trust. Yep. This is good. Good conversation. Um, OK, so let's totally flip the conversation. Um, you know, before we run out of time, t- let's talk about your book. Um, it's and like I think the one I think having a podcast, it's it's such a brilliant way to accidentally author a book. Like we we have a couple coming out, one soon and one next year, and we just realized we had all these books because we have all these years of like content, and we were like, wait a second, we can just go back and like transcribe this stuff, and then voila, there's books and ideas and. There's all kinds of stuff. But from from you, I want to know, like, what what made you author this book and what's a little bit about and why people want to get their hands on it? Well, my book is actually for everybody. It's not for, for, for say, the 102 person in uh, crypto. If anybody has listened to our conversation today about decentralization and ASIC miners and and they're following it, this book is probably not for them. (laughs) (laughs) It's straight, it's straight up. Um, but it, it, it is for people that, you know, are, that want to know about Bitcoin, want to have a good story and want to understand the bare bone basics of what's going on in the technology. This story follows a, a character that we have on the show quite often. His name is Johnny. And Johnny has a wife and two kids, uh, Gina and Riley, and they have friends and they have, you know, a, a life and jobs and what have you. And Johnny, you know, through his story, gets, in, gets in, into Bitcoin, buys his first Bitcoin on Coinspace. And, coin, and and after after buying his first Bitcoin on Coinspace, you know he has his friends are also into it. They start you know uh, fomoing about ICOs. They start hearing some you know fud. The market's you know very volatile as it is, and Johnny gets lost. Johnny Johnny loses money. His wife is you know you know livid, 
His kids don't know what's going on because, of course, he, they find see tension in the house. His uh, friends are, you know, coming at, at him different ways. Some are FOMOing, some are fudding, some are not even, you know, talking about it because they think Johnny's just a, a complete, you know, nutter. So this is the conversation and the story that we all have. This is every one of us that gets into it is we, we put a little bit of money into it. We FOMO a little bit. We check our Coinbase account every every freaking day. Sometimes even wake up in the middle of the night to see what's going on, <laughs> flip it open and see what's see what's going on with coin, uh, Bitcoin price, and 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 at the end of it, we end up either making uh, mistakes um, or you know just losing sleep about it. So this book actually tells a story from basically the average person's perspective of us all cycling through these. 13 stages of emotions when trading, um, you know, uh, trying to understand and get a grip on the space. And at the same time, it is defining different terms when we come to them in the book. So, for example, if we hear blockchain off to the side, you can see a nice definition in the glossary and back about what is blockchain. Hash, hash rates, nonce, um, you know, uh, the SEC, you know, all these different terms that you're going to see what we're trying to get into and navigate the space. Uh, we're going to clarify that for everybody. So. And the characters in, in the book, we also have uh, we also based off of um, a lot of different people that we've, we've seen in the space. There's one character that I really, in, really, really am happy about is her name is Gina. It's also it's a uh, Johnny's daughter. And she is just one of those, you know, 14 year old girls that are just level headed. You know, that's just like probably mature, like to a 25 year old at, at 12. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. you just just already just 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 mature and she gets into it. You know, she starts uh, getting into Bitcoin as well with, with her dad, you know, toward the toward the end. I'm not going to tell, tell you how it ends up, but also becomes, you know, a leader in her community. So who is this book for? It's for kids as well. You know, so, so imagine if you have a daughter that's around 12 years old, you want to tell her about Bitcoin, get her this book. She can follow this great character of a strong girl that is learning how to code. Get, becomes a leader in her community as well, as well as, you know, her brother, Riley, and, and see what Johnny has in, in there as well. And you can give it to your mom, your brother, your sister, anybody else that might start dabbling to see how the journey was for a lot of people. Nice. That sounds like a good book. It's very, it sounds, the characters in your book sound like the characters that were brought to my attention by one of our listeners who popped into our Slack. And I was guilty of calling people lazy. And I was like, if you don't know about crypto, you're just lazy. And then he he like put me on front street and he was like, that's a very arrogant thing to say. And I was like, OK, tell me why. And he's like, because people have lives, man, like nobody's nerding out on crypto like you are. People true. have like wives and kids and husbands and daughters and sons and soccer practice and dentist appointments and like meetings the next day they have lives like they're not in they didn't make crypto their life and so to call swaths of people lazy um is just very arrogant to do and so i i apologize for that i'll apologize again but um it sounds like a lot of the characters in your book are those people that our listener was was talking about and so it'll be very relatable to anyone so uh, we, 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 we hope so we hope so yeah tell, tell tell our um audience how to find it so they can they can get to it they can pick up a copy well you can find it at crypto 101 podcast.com there'll be a pop-up that says buy the book <laughs> <laughs> and you click into that it's it's no no spammy thing it's just, it just takes you to uh, the, the book site which is book.crypto 101 podcast.com and uh you can buy it on barnes and noble on nook and paperback you can get it on uh kindle and amazon paperback you can get it on itunes you can get it with uh, bitcoin litecoin ethereum which is basically sending me a couple bucks and i'll send you out a book and um yeah, that's about it. Sweet. Um, is there anything else we should address to, to everyone? Let them know how to find you. If you know, maybe if they love this conversation, we could have it again. Except for all of us will be here. It will just be me and you. Have Corey and Cello. Um, That'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. I never. It feels good to me on a level. Like I don't think I soaked it in yet. But the fact that you listen to us shoot the shit every Sunday <laughs> and that inspired you to make your own show and like inspired you to learn even more and now become a community leader, you know, in this quote unquote space. Uh, <laughs> like yes, ominous, ominous, um, what's the word? Fuck. Ominous, <laughs> ominous, <laughs> ominous <laughs> space. The crypto space. Um, <laughs> But uh, that was that's very cool. 
and uh it's awesome seeing everything crypto one is one is uh, becoming so well, thank you man i appreciate that yeah there was a couple of people that i always uh, that i was listening to pretty religiously when i first started um you know getting into bitcoin and like i said you guys you guys were one of them um trace mirror was one of them and i wish trace would put out more consistent uh podcasts because you know his stuff was good and, and i think it was bitcoin knowledge yep. and uh but it's just like sometimes he just disappears for months <laughs> and then he's back yeah. he's like hey i got a podcast like what are you doing bro we didn't we didn't want to be that guy. We wanted to be the opposite of that guy. So <laughs> and then and then some people which just kind of went a little bit too too um uh arrogant. So I kind of stopped listening to them. But other than that is and I hope that was an arrogant statement, but <laughs> but yeah, no, I really enjoy what you guys do and I really uh actually um, am a little envious of the network that you guys built. It's a pretty oh. cool thing that you have with all the people that are are on there, the different shows, the different characters, the different uh ways to look at the space and um <laughs> so congratulations to you too man thank you thank you well we can wrap it up with our trademark question man um in 10 words or less can you describe blockchain bro you should have sent me that one before <laughs> <laughs> um, okay that's, that's, that. that's a good one that's that. a hard one bro uh let's see here 10 words or less blockchain is something that you need to embrace yourself go Seven words, eight words, something that you need to embrace yourself. Go. All right. I like that, actually. It's a challenge. It's a challenge and a definition. Well, thank you very much. Um, I call you Matthew or I call you Aaron? Uh, Matthew. At Matthew. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you For you guys listening now, you should be on the lookout for when we go on Crypto 101 and we, we're we on the, we're the visitors here. He was the visitor to our home court today, and we're going to be the visitors to your home court um, then. And yeah, look forward to your growth, our growth, growing the whole uh, community together. So, Right on, man. Thank you. Looking forward to talking to you guys on our show. So we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank cool. you. Bye, bro. And that was the interview with Matthew Aaron, host of the Crypto 101 podcast, author of Crypto the crypto 101 book i don't think i got that right but we are going to link it in the show notes um very are interesting we? hopefully we say that and sometimes it doesn't all we don't always follow through i may or may not get around to that it may or may not happen how nonetheless <laughs> um i'm sure you'll you'll hear a lot of, about it i think andreas antonopoulos even gave it the old uh gave it the old blessing what do they do the catholic people they like throw smoke at people uh <laughs> I don't oh, think the, that's what works. Smoke chain, yeah, I've seen them before. There's the Catholic Church channel that you scroll that you get on every once in a while. You get on like that? Throwing, well, yeah, man. I like to see what's going. On. Look, of all the religions, I think they're the ones most suited to fight demons. Have you seen their outfits? I don't know. I'm not gonna go into that, but they're what? throwing smoke <laughs> at people with the with the pot. I know but, what you're talking about. Yes. Okay. All yes. right. Um, smoke pot we're publishing uh we're publishing a book uh focusing on andreas where we take all of the all of his appearances on our podcast and we're going to transcribe it and it's going to read as one long conversation over the years is that something that you would buy taylor do you think the public will want that don't lie i mean i would buy it i don't i'm a terrible judge of the public though <laughs> the public doesn't well, think we so. got one sale in the bag <laughs> yep there we go <laughs> worth it <laughs> We can go to Starbucks on that. Now us. that you've committed, let's make the price of the book like <laughs> super high. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> then you only have to sell one. Yeah. yeah. Sounds um, like a good plan. But while we are talking about that, the first book is the, we're getting the, 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 damn it, what are they called, Cello? It starts with the proofs. The proofs. We're getting the proofs soon. It's a hard word. So it's, uh, <laughs> that it's, book will uh, be ready to go um, uh, December. Uh, probably if we get a storefront up, you can start buying that. That's a Christmas. big old lift. <laughs> We've been yeah, talking about a storefront for years now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so it'll be on Amazon. It'll, that it'll be out if, there. The big if is tinier now. Um, so is there anything that's been like boiling you guys' goose in crypto lately? Yeah, the price. Fatigue. Uh, the personalities. Yeah, fatigue setting in a little bit. This bear market is is, I feel like it's the same, just more magnitude because there's more people. You know what I mean? And just it's I guess the magnitude is what makes the fatigue set in. I'm getting tired of the personalities and tired of the. Um, I feel like people are grasping on to like 
drama or like instigating drama to make up for the the lack of like volatility or the lack of excitement around the price so that's probably what exhausts me more so than than the price itself is just going on twitter and and just like whether it's little bickering or like you know huge showdowns like bitcoin hash uh yeah that's that's the thing it's like everyone's like who's a developer is like oh yeah oh, oh, there's no distractions now that you know there's no bull run but there's always going to be drama so what drama do you want do you want distractions of volatility or do you want rich people making bets on cruises about who's right and all this you know yeah i think i'd rather take the prior than the latter i mean as i mean as a builder it's i do get to focus a lot more on how to make things better how to prepare for the next for the next bull run when everyone starts flocking in and who's drastically ignorant doesn't know what they're doing but wants to throw their money at it and and try and use it uh but it's it's like i don't know it's when I when the price is going like crazy, I get distracted because I'm watching my my portfolio the whole time, trying to figure out when I'm going to exit to secure my life better. Like I mean, like, it, <laughs> yeah, Corey, that's that's another T-shirt. Uh, <laughs> going to be drastically ignorant. I'm going to wear that shirt around. <laughs> drastically ignorant. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it it does kind of suck that price is like an innate aspect of all this. It just does. There's it doesn't no way suck. It's it. cool. It's new, but it's it's difficult because, uh -huh. like, when like, I think we were, I was watching the security panel at DevCon, and that was one of the things that the, all the security experts were talking about is, is something that's completely novel about these systems is that no other system can you have a measurable quantity of how how much a infrastructure system is worth, like how much something is secure is directly related to how much money is put into it and you know exactly how much that is because it's public and so like you understand how how secure or private something needs to be based on how much money is put into it so like the fact that we have money that's a natural part of these systems is a really interesting thing it allows us to reason about like how much we should care about it uh really really easily but it also adds, adds a lot of consequences because you can make something and not understand how much money could potentially go into it and then you're basically either directly or indirectly responsible for all of the people who use it and the money put inside of it. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, that like gives me anxiety. No, that's what I think happened. Like, so, you know, Ether Delta, the SEC settled with the original founder this week or last week or whatever. But I think that Ether Delta is a perfect example of, you know, an engineer, smart guy, excited about crypto, creating a product. And then, you know, it blowing up and him going, oh, shit, like, is this legal? Is this secure? Is this am I ready for this? This was this wasn't supposed to go like this, you know, and now he's in in hot water with the SEC. And, you know, some people online are like, oh, he should have known better or like, oh, he deserves it or whatever. But in my opinion, it's like, dude, this guy's an engineer excited about crypto. I don't think he deserves any of that. Like, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. I. I can't really fault the SEC for for taking the steps that they're they're taking. That's their job, but you know, it's 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 a bit it's a bit scary that you can accidentally sort of go down a path and then only later realize how how much money is going through your service and realize that the security is not up to par or realize that you have no idea what you're doing legally. I mean, it's it's a it's a siren song for the builders out there that say prices are irrelevant or that they don't care about price. Mm -hmm. you need to you have to because if you're going to build something that potentially holds a lot of money you're going to be responsible if you build it in certain in certain ways for that money and if you don't take the precautions necessary to make sure things are done right that or or like the legal um due diligence to make sure what you're doing is it conforms to the, the uh, jurisdictions that you're going to be in then there's there's potential consequences and if you just put your head down and say i'm an en engineer i don't care you could fuck yourself yeah. Mm hmm Not in a good way either. No. <laughs> um I'm gonna start calling the SEC the flex EC because they are flexing Damn. uh as they say in like nineteen ninety eight, they are flexing nuts on everybody right now. <laughs> They're this Ether Delta guy who got popped. I didn't see that coming because I was like, Oh, it's a decentralized exchange. Oh, but he got some centralized punishment. <laughs> And then, <laughs> then uh, 
now they're there's what is it paragon whatever they're being paragon ordered Prime. to refund the the money that was invested into their token which is uh that's a that's a flex right there sec is flexing man they've been in the gym i'm so happy we said no to them when they they were coming on our show <laughs> no hard no too no sorry i'm not going to be involved with whatever the stuff you're doing is it doesn't it just smells way too fishy I remember she sent us like a, you know, why do you feel that way letter? She wanted to have a conversation with me about like, well, how I felt that way so she could sway my, sway my opinion. And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to say no. Your white papers emojis. Yeah, but you got to get the code in the emoji. But we've got oh, TI, or was it the game? I forget which one it was. It's the game. Yeah, it was the game. Oh, yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. The, what does he have to do with crypto? Like, <laughs> that, 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 that is a fault. That's, a, that's a big red flag for me. Although I really want to talk to the game. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about when it comes to cryptocurrency. He was a top 10 Madden player. Now that's impressive. Really? But, uh, yeah, the game. Never would have thought. You'd think he'd be rapping and working on his craft. But he was working on the no, he, was, he was rapping while he and was just shit talking strong. to the people he was beating yeah. on Madden. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of rappers have Twitch channels now. It's, it, you're going to start seeing a radical shift in that silliness. Oh boy, video yes. gaming is about to go the way of the dodo bird. Yeah, I don't. In my brain, this is why I, I, I don't. Why I said earlier, like I don't know what the public wants. Like Twitch, I don't get it. Like I don't get it. Like why do you like why you're going to go sit and watch someone else play video games? Yeah. Like, that doesn't oh. make a lick of sense to me. I do it. Taylor, do you have, like, super young people <laughs> on your squad? Do you have super young people oh, on your Oh, they team? all are Twitch people. Okay, yeah, here's what I, I spent. Every single one of them. <laughs> I spent maybe five to six hours working with a super young cat. I mean, 21, 22, last night working on, like, our social. And it was just such a breath of fresh air uh, how little thought goes into things. And you could just kind of not care about stuff and i was like oh i remember that age and like so we're putting together like these visuals to put on our social and i was like well why would you do it like that and he was like because it's fucking lit that's why and i was like <laughs> i was like is there any strategy to this are you gonna put like five posts a week he's like no man i'm gonna post this shit it's fucking lit people are gonna like it everybody's gonna love it and i was like okay all right yeah, I'm i guess terrified I'm terrified of getting older and working for someone younger that's terrifying it's there's definitely there are days when i feel incredibly old um one of the like what was the other oh, okay so on all hands a couple weeks ago i go we we're talking about gods unchained right which is this like trading card game on 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 the blockchain and Good i asked, on the show. yeah i ask my team if any of them played like ever played trading card games in real life and literally Every like seventeen of them just like looked at me like I was a freaking moron because yeah they all have and I, I just I've never done that before and I just sat there and was like oh okay well <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had Magic the Gathering when we were little yeah I mean uh, I but... yeah I never see I like played Pokemon for like maybe five minutes <laughs> <laughs> who, who dared play Magic though I played Magic. Like if you okay, had a duster so. and you had, I did not have a duster. Played magic. Yeah. <laughs> I was a star well, athlete, sir. Well, back when I was teaching the youngins, they had Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, uh, Pogs. Man, there were Pogs. We had Pogs. Oh, but po yeah, but Pogs was a strategy. It's like give me, just I'm gonna slam this thing, yeah. and take your cardboard. But there, <laughs> there's they have like Pokemon. They have like Dragon Ball Z. They have all kinds of stuff, man. Well, and they like, have all these digital ones now. So there's like, oh god, mm -hmm. I'm gonna make a fool of myself. It's like Hearthstone or something, where it's like yep, it's all, that's a big one. it's it's all digital. Uh, which again, and this is the question I had about Gods Unchained was, but do you really want to open a pack of cards on your computer? Like, isn't part of the experience doing it in real life and like hearing and feeling and smelling and all of like those things? They sold a card for like 80 ETH, didn't they? Or like 100 not ETH? anymore. Uh, not anymore, man. Well, I don't know, Taylor, you probably don't know Jesse, but he's the co host of our headline show. Mm -hmm. He got into crypto via trading Counter Strike Go gun skins on the underground oh. video game 
digital trading market, like some of these guns will go for thousands of dollars because it has like a tiger imprint on the side. I used to oh, make a bunch dude. of money on the Diablo yeah. two auction, Diablo three auction house. I mean, I used to, I used to play the game. I used to buy and sell on the Diablo three real money auction house. It's just based on, uh, you know, gear that people needed yeah. for certain builds. I sold my Final Fantasy eleven character for a lot of money. It's bananas. I don't get it, but it, maybe you're not supposed to get everything. You're just to go with it because it's fucking lit. So <laughs> <laughs> like, that's that's what I learned last night. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and he was saying things to me like, "Look at your look at your bio on your Instagram. There's not a single emoji in it." And I was like, "Wait, <laughs> am, I, am I breaking a rule there? Having words?" And he's like, "Yeah, you're breaking a fucking rule." And I was like, well, what if we want to post like videos on there, like five minutes? And he was like, are you kidding me? I see a five minute video. I'm never looking at it ever. I'll tell people not to look at it. 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds. <laughs> I was like, damn, man, what is wrong with you guys? How much attention span is, is non-existent? <laughs> yeah. Literally non-existent. You can't get me in 30 seconds. I'm not watching it. Okay. <sighs> All right. That's a, Wait, that's a really no. wrap. Hold up. What, what? one of the... Why do you have to have emojis in your Instagram profile? She's caught up on that one. She's not. She's not letting that one go. <laughs> because I, I don't know. It's like it's. Uh, he actually called ours unprofessional because we only had words. He was like, "It's unprofessional. I only have words. You gotta have emojis in there." I'm. I'm not. I'm not catering to that. I refuse. And I was like, "Well, here's the thing. He did one post, and he had more likes on that one post than I've gotten in like a year's worth of oh, Instagram posts." Yeah. <laughs> so I was like. You're gonna have to give in, Corey. Oh I man, guess it works. We got like we I'm gonna be I'm gonna followers. be the dry old fart of this group. Y'all can do whatever you want. I'm gonna maintain the like the like steady signpost of 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 traditional uh, non- social media non ridiculousness. <laughs> uh, well, you you can put your pinky up if you want to, uh, but I'm I'm throwing 35 hashtags. In there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm putting emojis in there too. I'm gonna have nothing but but like. Uh, Eggplants, just all eggplants are my, my description. <laughs> eggplants in the splash symbol, and that's when we get in trouble. Um, well, I guess that is a good uh, way to wrap up the show. By you could check out our 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 newly revamped socials as we slowly build those up because we've been neglecting them for a while. So our Facebook looks new, our Instagram is new and fresh, our YouTube is now curated, and we are syndicating our shows onto YouTube now. So, you know, you share the YouTube link with your friends. We will not or... respond to comments on YouTube. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We If you troll, we will troll back. So no, Hard. that'll come. No, that <laughs> Um, Let's see what else. We have the book, In 10 Words or Less, Can You Strive Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Blockchain? Um, that is finished. It's getting proofed. Um, so that'll be in the wild soon. Um the publication, the Bitcoin Podcast Network uh, blog on Medium. Sorry, that is horrible. Medium.com slash the Bitcoin Podcast blog. We'll take you to that. Corey's got some stuff on there. Colin has some stuff on there. I got some stuff on there. Uh, we write stuff from time to time. Am I leaving anything out, guys? There's a lot. Yeah, of a lot. Huh? Yeah, there's, there's, a lot, a lot. there's a lot of other stuff you're leaving out. I don't think we have time for it, though. Okay. Uh just go to the network. Everything's there. Yep. Join the Slack. And then uh, mycrypto.com, of course. Taylor, you want a plickety plug? Yeah, mycrypto.com, uh, at mycrypto on Twitter. That's the best place to get a hold of me. I think we do have an Instagram if you're one of those people. It doesn't have emojis, though, so don't Step hate Step your me. game up. You're breaking a rule. <laughs> you're unprofessional. <laughs> you are very unprofessional, Taylor. <laughs> You got to have your socials in there listed with emojis. I learned that last night. And why? Why, Taylor? That's fuck. Because it's fucking lit. That's why. (laughs) That's that's it. All right, guys. Uh, Shout out to Zoe Saldana and Zazie Beats. Uh, Play the outro.
Oh